speaker today is Martin Elsman, um, and he's filling in uh, Lubin, uh, who is missing um, uh, Yeah, and uh, Martin is going to talk about the work on shape constraint array programming with size dependent types. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, uh, joint work with uh, also Truls Henriksen um, and, uh, and the rest of the, the uh, FUSAC uh, team and at DIGU, uh, including also Cosman, um, uh, Just to mention uh, here, Lubin was an internal uh, uh, coming from uh, ENS uh, PSL and, um, and uh, working on this thing um, together with, uh, with, with Trolls and I. And the whole thing is about the shape constraints array programming with size dependent types. So the, a little bit of context here. Uh, so basically the, the context is the FUSAC uh, compiler. Uh, it's not mentioned explicitly here, but uh, this is a, a data parallel language for, for, um, for programming mainly GPUs, but also uh, it also has backends for, for uh, multi-cores and uh, plain C and, and so on. Um, the, one of the goals of the FUSAC compiler uh, is to allow uh, programmers with a lot of abstractions, but also at the same time uh, don't pay any uh, compromise with respect to performance, which means that all abstraction mechanisms are eliminated at compile time. So that includes uh, modules and uh, high order functions to some extent uh, that, that it's possible. Uh, and, uh, and then of course there's a lot of work on, on, the, on the type system for FUSAC. So the context here is of course arrays and um, uh, which is really the fundamental building blocks here for high performance data parallel programming uh, in, in used in various contexts, machine learning, but it could also be uh, for, for, for other tasks. Uh, and, uh, and then of course the whole thing is um, uh, take uh, departure from, uh, from these hardware trends which push towards this increased focus on, uh, on array programming. Um, parallelism in particular. Um, so um, in, those, in that context, uh, programming with these multidimensional arrays really often uh, depends on dynamically typed arrays. So that is in Python and other frameworks. Uh, there you, uh, you basically uh, can, can, uh, can write programs, and we saw this, uh, th this, uh, this morning, uh, that uh, of course we shouldn't care too much about the statics, but uh, this is really the context. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, I hope so. But this is a, this is what we want to actually try to work with here, uh, giving more guarantees with less effort, so to speak. Um, and um, and what we see, of course, usually is that when you zip two things, uh, not only are you not uh, guaranteed that the, the program might fail if if um, uh, you, you don't get any static errors, maybe when the arguments don't match. But also the uh, the result, uh, um, the, you don't really uh, get the guarantee that, that that the size of of the source arrays are really propagated to the to the context in which the zipped arguments are, um, are used. So, um, so what we will uh, present here is uh, is really this idea of moving this checking to the uh, to the to the type uh, level, and that's of course not new. You can do so also with uh, dependent types, and uh, and the idea, of course, is to to make it a little less cumbersome. In particular, the uh, the uh, existential types will be kind of unpacked automatically uh, and packed again uh, once you uh, once that is needed, and then that that is kind of implicitly passed around uh, these uh, these sizes so that the programmer doesn't really see them at the surface uh, necessarily. You can be explicit about them. Um, uh, and then there are, of course, other, also uh, ways where, you, where, uh, the, um, the, where there are some limitations, uh, where you can then um, use some, some more dynamic approaches. You have some kind of typecast that we can use to actually enforce that, uh, that uh, dynamically that some size matches and here we present this uh, practical type system for array programming, which combines this dependent types aspects. Um, 
And then uh, this has been uh, implemented in the Futhark compiler, and and it turns out that uh, that that works out for for the entire uh, code base and all with not that many changes to the to the code. And now we can be more even more explicit about the sizes than we could usually uh, before. So now it's also, as we shall see, possible with this new work to to reason about the size of um, of the result of concatting two or two vectors, for instance, uh, and uh, so that so that we can be explicit about uh, those things as well. So let's just go uh, over some some basic examples just to get the flavor of it, of, uh, of what it looks like in Futhark. So here we can specify the the type of of, uh, of zip. Uh, so we can see here there's a little, a little bit uh, a kind of odd notation about how we abstract over things. When we abstract over sizes, we really say this is uh, for all n here with with the uh, with the uh, braces uh, with square uh, brackets, and then we have this uh, coming from the ML uh, tradition, pling a, um, which is used for specifying that these are uh, ordinary type variables. So then we can specify here, we can look at the type of zip which takes uh, two arrays, uh, one of size n and another one of size n. They can be of, uh, of different element types and then it produces something uh, of size n as well containing pairs of elements of, of, these, uh, of these types. So that's zip. We can also uh, declare a function map2 here which uh, is a higher order function. It takes, two, uh, it takes a, a function as argument from A to B to C, and then it takes an, um, two input arrays, one of size n and another one of size n, and then it produces a uh, result of size n here. So what we can see here is that we can be explicit about the sizes, but also that the implementation are not, is not really mentioning the sizes at all. There's no explicit um, unpacking uh, of, uh, of sizes here. So, um, so just simple uh, type checking here. We have uh, uh, then we, we can define the dot product, for instance, uh, on uh, on um, uh, on two vectors, can, and we see here we, that we use make use of map two here to supply the the uh, uh, multiply here with x and y, and then we sum uh, over this, and this is really a parallel reduction going on underneath here. Uh, there's a specific version in the F32 module that will uh, implement that using a reduction. So this is really a parallel uh, map reduce uh, the dot product. And again, that can be lifted to, to matrix multiplication. Uh, <coughs> and it's not really rank polymorphic. It's, it is really uh, specific here that, that A takes, it, A is an array of, of, of uh, dimension two and B is an, uh, also a, dimen uh, a dimension 2 array. But we can see here that we can specify that the inner dimension and the outer dimension of B here, the inner dimension of uh, A here, will match or need to match. So this is kind of the contract uh, made by the, uh, by the, uh, for the implementation. In order to call MATML, you need to establish that, that property. Uh, otherwise, you'll get um, a, a type error. Um, and again, we can see here we transpose B here, but we don't really reason about sizes inside the implementation. All that is done uh, explicitly or implicitly. Um, we could also, uh, let me see here, if we have dot product, we could also, instead of this dot product, have, have been explicit about this size here. So here we see that this is, we really use size polymorphism uh, here to make it implicit, but we could also have written n explicitly and say you need really need to provide an explicit argument. So that's kind of an uh, an alternative. Um, so that um, with the size polymorphism, it's really implicit, implicitly added by the by the compiler. So then um, we have various constructs here. We see uh, iota here. Uh, if you give it an n it will generate an, um, an array of size n. Of course, give, provided that n is, uh, is, uh, is positive, at least uh, it needs to have zero or more element, or, or be, be um, larger or equal than zero. Uh, and if not, uh, there will be a dynamic error. So it's not that this work will eliminate all dynamic errors, 
but it will make it, uh, make it possible to reason about uh, whether functions are compatible when, when uh, composed in different contexts. Okay, so there, there will be certain errors that are that are that are that are that appears at runtime. What happens here? Oh. Uh, <coughs> then uh, something new here. So here comes this, uh, which is also uh, the the work in in this paper is that that now you can actually write iota x plus y, and that will give you back an array of size x plus y. So now you have something explicitly of that of uh, size x plus y, and the uh, the context in which that uh, that appears then can be used for for various things. But now at least it's not really an existential size, or, uh, which would be an alternative would be to say, well, x plus y, we really don't know what that is. Introduce a new size which is existential, and then just say that array has that size ex uh, of an existential size. Here here we are more explicit. Uh, <clears throat> that means that we can uh, we can give a type to concat. So um, so now we can specify that concat takes uh, two arrays, one of size n and one of size m, and produces one of size n plus m. And now you can write things like um, concat iota x plus y iota c, and it will give you back something like this. Of course, you need to to insert the parentheses according to the uh, Association laws here for for plus, and then that that works out. So sometimes it can be a little bit uh, difficult. You could be a, you could be explicit about about that in the types, uh, and that would be okay. You could also have a um, an implicit variation of iota. I mean, maybe you just want to specify that I'm really just creating an index space, and depending on the context in which that appears, it will be kind of uh, inferred automatically what that uh, what the size of that array will be. It might be sipped together with something else, where the, so that the uh, the the the, the, uh, the size will really be um, there could only be one uh, possible size, uh, and that is also possible um, as long as uh, as uh, we can uniquely determine uh, the the size in the context. Otherwise, there would be a static error. So um, so again. We, um, uh, we have various properties in the type system here. So in particular, arrays are always regular. Uh, so you could see that, that uh, you can be polymorphic about arrays. And this, is, this was from the very beginning of the design of Fulsack, that you could say something was some array of, uh, with elements of type A. And the array was, uh, was uh, of, of, uh, of some particular size. But, uh, but the inner elements could also be an array. And instead of being explicit about the uh, all dimensions, you can write functions generically, so to speak, that are in, in some, some sense polymorphic in the, in the ranks. But they're not really uh, polymorphic. You, just, you can specify map, and then that will be kind of uh, mapping the function to, the, uh, to, the, to each of the underlying elements. But it's not like it, it will, it will uh, then use f on all um, all of the elements that are the low level, the leaf elements of the arrays. It's really at just at the next level. So this is where you specify it in Fulsack. So that comes with this trade-off that now you need to, to put up some additional uh, rules saying, well, um, the arrays need to be um, to be um, uh, to be regular, meaning that if you have an array of subarrays. Each of the subarrays, uh, or all the subarrays, needs to be of the same size. So that's kind of a side thing that comes with the with, with the um, with the obligation from the users. You cannot write something like um, so map and then um, mapping over some elements of, of uh, i and then calling iota i on, on that thing. Then you might get irregular structures. But of course, if you know that that uh, that I, the the i is really not uh, is, is not something that uh, may vary, uh, then, uh, then it works out. And, but you need to then establish that things are really regular. Um, there are other things that can fail. So in Futhark, we have some sort of, uh, of um, support for what seems like imperative functions. Uh, uh, also, you can access individual elements using array index notation as we, 
as we see here. Um, but um, I better look here on a point. So here you can uh, you can see this may fail dynamically either if i is negative or if it goes beyond the boundary of the array. Um, but of course, you you tend to to uh, to uh, to have a language where you use the combinators for 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 working with the array so that you don't really need to to work with the individual elements here, but you can do so. And in some algorithms that needs to be important because uh, it might be very difficult to, to, uh, to implement uh, uh, in a functional style. There are some algorithms that are hard to, to implement in a functional style. Um, yes, and I think we also, uh, we can have these construction errors if IOTA is given an argument of uh, a negative argument that may fail. And the escape hatch here is then to move the static checks uh, to, uh, to runtime. So uh, let's, let's see how this will work. How is the, this of course works with the, uh, the, the implementation in Futhark uses is based on unification. So uh, if we have uh, two, we have the type of concat here and then we see a particular context where concat is applied to uh, two arrays, uh, one of size A, F32, and one of size 2 times B, F32. Then um, we really um, uh, have this uh, introduce new uh, type variables, and then we have these uh, unification constraints here, where we basically say that uh, that um, uh, that the result will be of type A plus B gamma here, and gamma is an F32. So that means this is basically just simply saying that this is plain unification that will that will allow us to to reason uh, uh, at this level. And then, of course, it comes with some uh, all the limitations of unification and all the uh, also problems that it comes with it, um, uh, with the um, with the limitations, of course. Yeah. It's also purely syntactically, and that, that is kind of a, a little bit odd so, so, uh, and interesting. And I think one of the main takeaways here, which might uh, give a, uh, some uh, thought for, uh, for good discussions later on. So uh, let, me see, let us see here. So if we have function zip, um, uh, we, are, we need to provide something of the same type. But now, of course, if we do zip concat AB and concat BA, we kind of know that that will work, but uh, in Futhark, that will complain. Futhark will complain about this, of course, because it doesn't know anything about whether plus is, uh, is commutative or not. Okay, so so uh, what you can, or, or what we see here is that, um, that uh, if we write a function foo here, which will ba basically extract the sizes from something of size n plus m, then if we, uh, if we call foo on concat AB, we get A and 2 times B, and if we call it on BA, we get 2 times B and A. Okay, so it really syntactically just deconstructs the, the, uh, uh, the constructor that the plus in, in, the in, the, in the type, with all what comes with it. Uh, so no, other, no rules, or not, no, uh, no algebraic uh, simplification rules or anything comes, uh, comes with it. Uh, so that means that we can we can do some uh, some fun stuff. Uh, for instance, uh, in Futhark now the unflatten has been uh, really re-specified to be of this uh, of the type specified here. So if you give something to unflatten with a size n times m t, then that will give you back uh, something of size uh, an array a multi a two-dimensional array n m t. Well, it may actually, it's only on flattening the, f the, the, outer, um, the outer two um, uh, elements, so T itself might, might again be an array, right? Um, but this is, this is a little bit odd, odd, of course, because, of course, if you gave it a different types, with, if you commuted uh, N times M with M times N, then, of course, the, uh, it will be a different shape uh, of the array here. Similarly, we can do a split. So now you can, uh, you can implement a split function which will take something of size n plus m and split it up into two arrays, one of size n and one of size m. Okay? So this was what I thought. This, the first time I saw this, I was like, what about all the, uh, shouldn't we add the, uh, maybe 
over the years, maybe we might reintroduce properties about uh, or introduce properties about plus in the compiler, and then this would clearly not be something you would you would see. But it turns out actually to be quite nice to be uh, to uh, to have to work explicitly about these things. Um, of course, it might be a little bit uh, difficult sometimes to read what really happens with this iota a plus b plus c. So you need to know about the associativity of, of the operators and, of, of course, to actually uh, uh, reason about the sizes itself. Uh, and then, of course, uh, also due to how uh, split is implemented, of course, you can see here that since these sizes can be negative while still be providing a, an array which is really has elements in it, uh, then, uh, then split needs to, uh, to uh, kind of fail if it turns out that n is negative itself. So, um, so that means that, uh, that split may actually uh, fail at, at runtime. So we have this support and a quick uh, question from the audience. Yes. It, it, uh, it really depends on the size of the, if, if you call it uh, of, uh, an array of size 5, for instance, then simply it doesn't, uh, it doesn't type check because it doesn't have the form n plus m. It has an immediate 5. So you need to cast it yourself to uh, something of size 2 plus 3, and then it will. That means essentially a 2 plus c size array is different from a 5 size. Yeah, well, it's uh, in it, the type of it is different, but um, maybe the array itself is not different. That's a, it, well, the the uh, the cast may come as a, with a uh, with a runtime if the, if the type checker cannot uh, infer that these two things are equal. I mean, if you're seeing five and you're doing two plus three, then the type checker will will say yes, okay, so. That will work out. In other cases, it will be a dynamic check because it depends on input values. So there's a support for for for, for typecasts. Can I ask that question again? Fantastic. The sizes are really stored symbolically. You don't store, you don't compute two plus three. That's five. You store the size five. You're really storing the size. Uh, well, in the th uh, and what do you mean by store at at compile time? Well, um, because dynamically, it is really the size the the, uh, the the size five which is stored. Um. Yeah. I knew it would give a rise. To <laughs> So, uh, so of course, uh, one of the escape hatches here is that we, we need to have the uh, the dynamic typecast here. So, uh, in any expression e, we can, uh, uh, which is an array of that thing, uh, it will of course say it has to be an array. It has to be of some size, uh, and the elements needs to be of size t. That will be checked. But the but the typecast here is only with respect to the sizes. Everything else is uh, is, um, is is done statically. Um, so then, uh, since this is not concat AB, concat BA is not well typed, then we can now add a, con uh, a type constraint uh, specifying uh, that it is of size A plus B, uh, and then uh, we'll get something which is well typed. Um, and of course, that doesn't change the structure of the type, it only uh, changes the sizes in it. So uh, again here, if we do split, this is what we saw before, we need iota 5, we need to cast it to 2 plus 3 because before we can split it. You can write your ordinary split functions as you would with saying, <coughs> give me a number and another number and then split it. Uh, I mean, that, that is definitely possible. I'm just busy saying here that it, it's also possible to write these kind of functions where you extract the sizes and use them in some concepts. Question? Uh, yeah, so when we write a type notation like this, we only write for every expression. It's the start of the expression, it's like the basic type. We don't 
write for the first one, you can only write you know, the second. Yes. Yeah, this is all what is needed. Yeah. Short question. So, so what exactly the kind of set of expressions that is allowed at this position? The way you have plus is it arbitrary expressions? Arbitrary expressions. Okay. Um, and let's just answering your question here. So you could of course uh, write, write a count function which takes a, a predicate and an array, and then it gives you the number of uh, times that. Uh, that property holds, uh, or the number of elements that, that, uh, that uh, for which this uh, property is true, um, and then it gives you back that number, and then you can write a filter function, a, a version of filter which is very specific, saying, saying uh, that the, the number of elements that's really uh, computed here is the count of p on as. So you can specify that. Um, uh, now, Fusak doesn't have any, uh, you know, uh, proof reasoning tools besides those that are there, so we haven't explored this possibility. So the way the, the ordinary filter function is, is that it really just returns an existential size, uh, which seems to be, and then it, it tracks that around, uh, and, uh, and that seems to be uh, the, the most useful one. Um, but there's a way you can you can you can insert explicit tests to have this one to be the the uh, the real implement the the, uh, the basic one and then have a filter one which is more abstract or uh, that that basically just uh, returns an extension. So you can have a layer of specification as well if you want. There was a question down there. Yeah, sorry. So you can uh, Yes, if it doesn't match, if the sizes doesn't match, then there will be a, a runtime crash. Then? If you take this filter, which has that type, and you explicitly cast it to size on does it actually run count? Yes. Um, so here is the, uh, the, the one that is implemented, and the existentials will basically just use the, the, the syntax for that is this question mark there, uh, and then that can you can have some you can use that also for specifying things that are uh, extensive types with, with more structures in them, where you say that you have uh, some witness elements and you uh, you also have functions that takes ex precisely that number of that, that size. You can even use phantom sizes to re reason about other properties than sizes, so you can use them as as uh, as a tool for reasoning. Um, and that, of course, works with all these existential things. Um, um, <coughs> there's a, the, the other way of, of getting access to the existential sizes is to be uh, explicit about them. So here we are opening up a filter uh, and then basically saying uh, n is now in scope. So, but here, of, uh, of course, you, you can write length of a, but you could also just write n. And so, so um, this is possible even if, fill, if it, even if, if we are not manifest about the size. So you can write something like length of filter of p of x's, uh, which will basically give you back the um, open up the existential and then then uh, then reason about it. the definition of length will basically just extract the size from any arbitrary um, array of size n. Uh, uh, and then just return in. So the length is constant Yes. Um, and I'm sorry, this one was the one point I really didn't get from the previous presenter. So, uh, so uh, what was really meant by not explicitly unpacking, I think it has to do with length here. It's not that like we're not using in here. So sorry for this particular point. Uh, I'm going to gloss over over this one. Sorry. Um, so uh, that's a formalization, um, and uh, the formalization is uh, is basically just extending previous uh, work here. The type system, it, it comes with a uh, uh, the, the thing has been proved for a um, for kind of a, a large subset of the language. There are some restrictions that we haven't covered more in the paper about that. There's a dynamic semantics and then a type system with a, with a soundness property. 
uh, <coughs> basically specifying here that uh, that if we have that E is of type mu here, and we know that uh, the static environment here is consistent with uh, with uh, a dynamic environment, and we know that uh, E is uh, reducing to some value V in that dynamic environment, that we also know that the value has that the type mu in that uh, environment. Okay, so so. Um, the environment says also something about uh, both of sizes and of course of the uh, of the uh, uh, internal values or whatever type we have here. Um, <clears throat> then that, there's a, a bunch of safety property about the size matching. Once you uh, match and extract the sizes from a race, um, and there are some properties there uh, specified in the paper about that. It comes with some uh, some limitations that we uh, that we still need to look at in more detail, and the odd thing is that something like um, like empty arrays really caused some issue about how we extracting the, the strategy has been to separate separate the sizes from the arrays so that you don't really need to pack the sizes together with the arrays in the implementation. That seems to be more necessary in the uh, there's a lot of machinery in the compiler to actually deal with this, but in the formalization. Uh, Keeping that distinction just is a, is a little bothersome. It's much more easier if we just uh, mat, uh, pack up the sizes with the arrays. Uh, then we, we will also be, be able to, to deal with the empty arrays. And that has to do with all the, the uh, sizes of the, the inner sizes of arrays. So it's not only the size of the arrays, but the shapes of the arrays that, that should be packed up with an array. Then we kind of know, we would know the structure also for things that have an outer zero size. So we, then we would know, to know what would be the sizes of the inner dimensions. Uh, and that seems to be important if we want to deal with languages like APL, compile those down to here, because they have really um, uh, important properties about how to work with zero uh, length dimensions and how that, that works out. Um, we haven't formalized anything about the unification process. Uh, there's also um, what we can see here is that there's no real uh, it, it specifies if E really evaluates to a value V. So we, we haven't said anything about non-termination. And there is in Futhark a way of specifying while loops. Um, so there is some kind of uh, some non-termination in the language. Uh, but we have uh, eliminated that for, for, to make it more simple here um, in this sense. Um, more in the paper, uh, specifics about the formalizations. There are also, uh, and, uh, and proofs, there's also actually a uh, mechanization, a part uh, 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 up to, uh, that we haven't dealt with renaming of bound variables and, and, uh, and it's implemented in COG. So this is something, some, some things that needs to, to be done. But it actually helped us, even though that property is not fully proved uh, mechanically, then it helped us actually find some box also during the, the uh, mechanization uh, for that thing. There's a lot of discussion of related work, a lot of, uh, uh, of things here, of course, uh, in the community. Uh, so um, so uh, I think that was it for, uh, for the presentation. I hope you could live with, uh, with me uh, giving the, the presentation. So thanks. So can you go back to the slide with the, um, the query, the question mark for the uh, existential? Um, so you could say something more about the type of filter there. It produces a list of unknown lengths, but you know that it's at most n. Um, and so you, without going all the way to full dependent types, it, you could have had a fin n type. And that you could also use that for the indexing that would allow you to specify avoid out of bounds errors. So you, but you don't do that. We don't do that. We have been playing a little bit earlier around uh, with refinement types. And here, uh, I, do, I guess you could kind of uh, introduce another um, size m, right? Uh, and then say that it has n plus m. Uh, and then not making it explicit. But then you need to kind of also specify that that thing is non-zero, or, or uh, is larger than zero, or larger than. Uh, uh, 
Oh, minus. It should be, I guess, minus, right? So you could specify something like that with, with the additional property that you're only abstracting over things that are really natural numbers. And, and um, so that is something that could be useful, I think, uh, with certain kind of refinement size types or something. Uh, but this is, uh, this is not something we have worked on. Uh, but, but of course, we, we, <coughs> we kind of, once we realize that these things could be uh, negative, of course, you could do this extraction. And uh, then uh, we kind of, it's obvious that then you need to, to fail dynamically. And it's a, it's a little bit of a, right now it's a little bit of a trade-off because then you get these other dynamic errors and you are really pre pre trying to, to escape from dynamic errors, right? So it's a little bit, you know, what is the balance here? But in practice, it, it allows us actually to catch a lot of errors statically in, 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 for normal program development with a little cost uh, with, uh, compared to having a full dependent types. So I understand. I understand that you can create a, a, a dynamic check for this count p, right? So if that happens, then most likely the count p is going to be executed before you call filter. So my question is, why don't you make just m an explicit parameter and just call it then m a? Wouldn't that resolve your problem? <coughs> you you could definitely do that, and then you you are forced to call count first. And then well, you can yeah, but this is happening here anyways, right? Yeah, for this particular specification here. But this is also why we are not really using this, uh, because then now you really need to run this yeah, count, sure. right? So, so um, <clears throat> unless we can discharge that thing kind of <laughs> statically, then, uh, then uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, depending on whether filter will fuse or whatever it will, yes. So uh, we need to pre-allocate the array. And to do so, of course, you need to kind of figure out how many elements and so on. Hi, uh, a question is, uh, so the thing in the bracket, uh, so ha do, do we run unification after we, like, like we have a interpreter of running count and then we, we do some unification against some pattern, is that right? Let, let me just, one more, this thing? Yeah. So this is really syntactically count PAS. So if it, if it tries to unify with something which has precisely the same count PAS and the, and the variables are really the same, so the, the, you know, it's not just a string, but they, they need also to be the same ones in scope and so on, right? So that's in some internal machinery for that, because otherwise, of course, you could trick the type system to saying, well, this is another P, but syntactically they are really the same. But, but uh, that, that, that you need to be careful about, of course. But it really, uh, up to that, uh, it is really syntactical equality. So you need to, to either cast it to something which is precisely the same, or it will be a failure at study. An additional question is, uh, so if uh, one of our goal is to make more programs to be type checked, uh, m maybe we can consider more than first order unification. We can use maybe higher order unification or even, uh, I don't know, like, like sours for, for yes. refinement types. There are uh, plenty of, uh, of work we could do that, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, and. And we're not doing, uh, it, it's not that fancy. The, uh, it is unification based and uh, it also needs to, uh, <coughs> to, to run efficiently on all our benchmarks and things like that. So, so, uh, but it would be, be actually nice to see some of the proof obligations being pushed into external proofs instead of having runtime checks and then maybe see whether, whether it's possible to, to discharge some of the, uh, the obligations. Keeps coming. So I have another question about the um, the, the reshaping that you, you so you showed us unflatten and you showed us split. Do they actually do any data movement or um? uh, no? Right. So they they're just fiddling with descriptors anyway, and you're going to have to fiddle with descriptors anyway. So you might as well check them <laughs> while you're doing it. So it's not costing you anything else to do that, right? Um. Maybe I should. Uh, can you rephrase? Maybe I. Um, 
using approved. Uh, so un what what unflatten um, takes a, a rectangular array and gives you an array of rows, but it doesn't actually move the t's around at all. All it's doing is is changing uh, the syntactic description of the size, which is n comma m before, to well n comma m again, uh, just a different comma. Um, uh, so th there's not a lot going on there. It's, so that that uh, I, I, Bodo was uh, his his hair was curling, but um, I think he, he can he can relax. He? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I see. Yes. Yeah, so nothing is really going on there. Yeah. Maybe that's just the uh, the excuse for uh, for having these. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it produces two arrays, so there's some data movement there, right? Well, well, but in this case, here we are really, uh, you can implement split using takes and drops, right? Sure. So, and that, that's why, how you can see that, okay, take and drop will fail if it's giving negative numbers and so on. So I was rather more optimistic that um, uh, you could have a representation of the types that the common data and an array of array, so I can get that from that. It was also uh, paired of the array with different sizes. Mm. Yeah, and I can add that SIP is really doing that because we have this, uh, this isomorphism between um, uh, structs of arrays and arrays of structs. So, th so that is really a, an, uh, kind of an isomorphism. So that they are compiled away, so there are no products of... If I understand, sorry, Lenz Algerson has been talking about his a library called Opitopes that he's written that does does. That ah, yes, of, yes. Uh, and um, so what you're meaning here that really this could be two pointers into the same array. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and and the payload needn't move at all. Uh, yeah, and uh, the compiler does do something about memory. Uh, it might be that because it separates at some intermediate level, it separates memory from the arrays. Yeah. So, uh, so the memory layout, and then he uses this ilmats and yes, all that yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. reasoning about uh, yeah. where the, where uh, where the arrays are positioned, yeah. and so on. So it might very well be that it turns out that here is an instance of where, depending on the context and how it's inlined and so on, uh, that it actually are, is the, is a no-op here. Right. Whereas in other cases, it might actually not be a no-op. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks again.